Well, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the Drone and Architecture Roundtable. Um, I guess uh, I'll give a brief introduction to, uh, to our guests here today. Um, I'll start with Louis Armand to my right. Um, he is a writer, a visual artist, a critical theorist, currently the uh, director of the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory at Charles University. Um, his books include Videology 2015, <coughs> Orville Grider's Monkey 2013, and uh, many others. He's a member of the editorial board of Rhizomes um, and a founding editor of the online journal Hypermedia Joyce Studies. Uh, sitting to his right is Casey Carr, who's a security researcher, currently uh, working with Amazon, previously uh, uh, part of uh, the US Army, worked with the US Army, um, writes currently on hybrid warfare, terrorism, complexity in warfare, and sci-fi. And to his right is Dustin Breitling, and uh, who recently received uh, an MA in Geopolitics at Charles University. Um, he has uh, co-edited uh, Reinventing Horizons of uh, 2016, uh, as well as uh, Algorithms from 2017. My name is Pete Bohal, and once again, thanks very much uh, for coming to Drone and Architecture. This sort of itinerary for tonight will be uh, that Dustin will give um, uh, a brief introduction into the into the thematics which we will be addressing and then of course um, the round table will follow the table's not very much round but we would very much <laughs> like it if you if you perhaps uh, had questions and participated and uh, that would be wonderful so <coughs> okay thank you okay uh so uh for my portion of the presentation i'm going to just touch on an array of topics uh concerning more or less how drones in relationship to uh, the metropolis or an urban setting could potentially uh, transform architecture or as we understand uh, more or less cities themselves. However, at the same time, uh, I will be looking at uh, drones kind of through various uses, usages and various functions as well. Um, so first and foremost, uh, I think it's important to kind of tackle uh, what we see with kind of get to the next slide really quick. Uh, uh, uh. Unfortunately, that did not, okay, we'll, we'll just have to do this. Um, so, actually, it, 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 unfortunately, it did not come out. Okay. It's white. I know it's not the lights, but there's a particular image. Um, so, uh, what I wanted to focus on first and foremost, uh, is specifically drones and how they are capturing urban environments, such as environments in Syria, uh, particularly looking at Russia Today um, and Russia Today using drones to basically look at what's called ruin production or ruin imagery. Um, so the ruin production of the ruin imagery uh, is working on this idea um, simply how drones are kind of decontextualizing or dehistoricizing conflict that's going on in the ground. Um, so on ground we're talking about something that forensic architecture uh, themselves like to address, where, for example, you might have reporters, where you're having civilian stories, um, where you're having doctors, uh, where you're having various civilians trying to work together to kind of construct a narrative and to kind of construct a more, a greater, more thorough understanding of uh, certain types of events or certain types of atrocities. That when you see something such as a drone, uh, a drone is completely erasing. Um, so you have this kind of idea of a vanishing reference point uh, that I think would be something I'd like to have uh, to kind of put out there. Um, and so furthermore, I think it was quite interesting to see that uh, concerning with the Russia Today uh, drone imagery uh, that was broadcasted a couple years ago, um, at the same time the Syrian government uh, was equally broadcasting uh, via drones uh, images of the beachside and images of you know areas within Syria where uh, simply there was not any uh, conflict and where there wasn't any devastation and destruction. So again, kind of repeating this uh, element or this this uh, narrative of simply trying to you know erase any of the kind of ground fictional or frictional type of elements that normally we would associate with warfare and the destruction that's following. Um, and so actually, I'm kind of taking my interest from uh, this kind of approach from 
one uh, publication that was released on um, failed architecture uh, by Zina Zakabat, uh, his, his work, which I think also kind of uh, points out to how drones are kind of uh, these elements, these objects, these devices that are producing territory from, from the skies and producing territory from, from above. Um, and so looking at uh, this kind of idea about producing space and producing territory above, I think you can also see equally that uh, you have particularly artists such as James Bridal here, um, who, let me see, I would like to get, uh, 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 yes. Oh, yes, 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 that's probably why. There we go, yes. Uh, his work is Dronestagram, um, which, Particularly, is challenging the whole narrative that we are witnessing concerning drones, and as I said before, uh, the erasure of these uh, kind of particular vantage points or particular reference points um, that is that is lost when we're having this kind of godlike, transcendent image capturing the city. So, what Drone Scram for James Riddle was doing, uh, or what he was focusing on, is particularly he would go on Google Maps and look at the pull the sites uh, that's where drone strikes would happen. And then he would provide, uh, for example, as you see there, just a narrative that more or less is, is lost uh, or is more or less kind of erased uh, concerning the role of drones and uh, the destructive effects on the civilians. Um, and equally, we have uh, the work of Adam Harvey was also kind of approaching uh, a similar aspect concerning drones and rep representation in machine vision, uh, where as you see here, he's made a uh, silver garment uh, that's kind of more or less focusing on how drones have the capabilities of picking up uh, more or less your thermal signature, or your kind of uh, radiation signature of your body. And so kind of using this garment, it's another way to kind of escape and invade uh, kind of representation or made, uh, in this case, captured by some type of uh, infrared camera, in this case. Um, so, kind of departing also from our strict, um, I would say, kind of association of drones with, uh, with technically warfare, um, I think we're also looking at drones more and more becoming, uh, even though I don't think this is quite probably the proper usage of it, but uh, an integrative object. So you are seeing that how drones more and more are becoming integrated and flooding into the civilian sector. Um, so through the kind of civilian sector, we're seeing, of course, how we have uh, drones associated with deliveries. Uh, so probably the most common association or example we have of that is Amazon Prime Air, uh, which delivered, I think, was 2016. They did in Cambridge, England. Yeah, it started in UK. Yeah. Um, and, of course, as I was just showing you right there with journalism and filming and aerial photography, uh, disaster management, disaster management, uh, particularly where we're also seeing zones, uh, again, that have been devastated and employing drones for purposes of delivering certain types of materials and supplies uh, due to, let's say, infrastructure being uh, raised or, different, or infrastructure kind of um, rendering the whole environment incapable for normal types of deliveries. Uh, geographic mapping, so geographic mapping uh, is simply uh, more or less using drones to uh, have an understanding of, of a whole territory or a whole urban environment uh, that normally is very difficult from doing uh, from a ground level. So you can see for right now it's becoming more and more common industry is doing these 3D mapping and also uh, with 3D mapping you're having uh, visuals, you're able to kind of stratify, if you will, the kind of uh, territory vertically or the kind of the urban setting vertically. Uh, construction sites, which is something I will uh, touch upon later. Uh, drones also being able to kind of map out a construction site and also to be able to work with uh, what I'll show also briefly, um, kind of bulldozers and also um, excavators to kind of be working in a feedback loop of automation. And finally, precision, uh, precision agriculture. Uh, this is projected to be quite a booming industry. Uh, where about 80%, I was reading the estimates, about 80% of commercial drone use is going to be associated with agriculture. Uh, drones being used for purposes of irrigating and also to be planting seeds and also to be pro providing kind of imagery about the crop yields and crop harvest and so forth. 
Um, so one of the kind of questions I wanted to pose, and more or less hopefully we can see if this will feed into the wider discussion, uh, is this kind of idea of concerning a boomerang effect. Um, so first and foremost, uh, the kind of the question I want to get to is simply how, do, how does the employment of drones potentially transform urban space and architecture? And uh, secondly, um, what is what we're terming as a boomerang effect is how does, for example, drone testing in war-ridden and geopolitical zones of conflict, um, how does this kind of come back to the urban metropolis, uh, the urban uh, setting, and how can they potentially be used as urban surveillance technologies in, in Western cities? Um, so I think that would be something that Casey could possibly also address if we're going to be looking at zoning regulations as well. Um, so briefly kind of looking at the history of also uh, 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 drone warfare, it should be going back. Yeah, okay. Uh, so kind of the history of uh, drone warfare, or the history of drones, um, technically we can look at um, kind of the first examples of this would be in 1849, uh, kind of in the Veneto Lombardi Kingdom, uh, when Venice this time uh, was proclaiming independence uh, from the kingdom and what was conceived of uh, from the Austrian end was to actually load up uh, balloons with explosives and with these balloons with explosives what they would be doing is they would actually have a copper wire technically that would be attached to the balloons and the copper wire would be also attached to a galvanizer battery. Uh, so you would have persons basically outside of, uh, kind of outside the city of Venice uh, kind of in an encampment, and they would be triggering these explosives overhead of the city uh, to see if there would be actually any type of uh, action. Uh, apparently, there's some conflicting reports of how effective this was as a campaign. Uh, nonetheless, it does seem that this was kind of uh, considered kind of a modern-day predecessor. Um, and secondly, we get to uh, John W. Clark, who was also considered one of the original visionaries of the idea about drones. Uh, he defines drones, as, in this case, uh, as telecheric machines, um, which basically means that you would have uh, machines or objects that you can manipulate at a distance. Um, seeing these machines to kind of be able to go into kind of hostile environments, and by going through these hostile environments, they'd be able to remove any uh, objects that would be potentially obstacles or potentially um, any types of en environments that wouldn't, that normally human persons would not be able to kind of be able to um, assimilate it. Um, and so he's also, John W. Clark was giving this illustration and this idea how we consider these telecharge machines as kind of alter self egos for, for humans which I thought was quite an interesting way to potentially look at how drones are now more and more from kind of the civilian or from the more militaristic perspective uh, where we're seeing people behind control panels and behind screens as uh, more or less kind of controlling uh, drones and their uh, usage, especially on, on, on the battlefield as well. Um, and more or, less, more or less kind of the modern day uh, usage of drones also emerged with the Yom Kippur War, um, where, for example, uh, they were used to uh, deceive actually Egyptian, uh, kind of the Egyptian anti-defense uh, anti uh, forces. Um, so actually they would fly in drones and what the drones would be doing uh, is simply deceiving and deceiving the radar and deceiving the targets on the radar. So actually this, what it did is it um, basically propelled uh, the Egyptian uh, anti-defense uh, forces to basically be using up all their missiles and once they've used up all their missiles, uh, actually the uh, Israeli uh, Air Force would come in and uh, basically destroy their defenses. And interestingly enough, uh, one of the persons who was behind kind of the conception of drones, uh, or kind of the originator, is Abraham Karim. Uh, he was actually one of the first persons who designed uh, what we have today, uh, the Predator drone, the MSQ-1 Predator drone. Um, so actually he came, he came over to, after the Yom Kippur War to the United States to help out and kind of construct the first drone. Um, 
And so, interestingly enough, this became, in 1991, uh, this was also considered one of the kind of first uses, usages of drone, even on, on the battlefield. And this is considered uh, where, where there was the incident where you had five uh, Iraqi soldiers that were waving white flags um, in front of a drone, and as it's considered there, this was the first time uh, that man surrendered to a robot. Um, yes, that should be interesting. So, um, what we have next is kind of the culmination of right now, but maybe I should give some history between the Gorgon Stair and actually 1991. So, uh, more or less probably what most of us are aware of or familiar with is, uh, as I was talking about before, is this MSK-1 uh, Predator Jones. Uh, which has become widely used, but actually was just retired by uh, the air by the military. Um, so this is the drones that we've been more or less associating with Hellfire missiles, and that have been targeting civilians, whether they be in Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, or Somalia and Yemen. Um, and of course, one of the the narrative that's emerged around kind of drones and their usage is this idea about precision and that you can precisely uh, target and precisely orientate um, your uh, kind of uh, where you're going to be shooting your target and you can target certain individuals obviously. Uh, however, that's uh, not been the case and that's been, up, been stoking a lot of controversy, especially under the Obama administration uh, where there's been high incidents of uh, civilian deaths. Um, so due to this kind of high incident of civilian deaths, um, more and more the kind of narrative is, is kind of changing as to uh, more or less how, uh, how to kind of combat uh, the uses of drones due to the fact that it's, it's considered a very kind of radicalizing mechanism, uh, especially for a lot of civilians and a lot of um, uh, individuals that are living in Pakistan and, and Somalia and Yemen and so forth. Um, so, kind of the, also the kind of ultimate culmination, even though I think this is a very interesting quote that uh, Benjamin was talking about, how via something such as a drone uh, has the capabilities to do everything that's, uh, that you would like to do in terms of a warfare. Um, obviously, being able to kind of destroy at the, uh, at kind of the click of a, of a button whole cities and just and basically to undermine and to cut off as it says there are citizens lights air and life um, so as you see up there uh, there's what they call the Gorgon stair uh, the Gorgon stair is considered what will be the ultimate culmination uh, between drones and importantly um, imagery and surveillance <coughs> and cameras uh, so the Gorgon stair it the Gorgon derives from the kind of Greek uh, Medusa notion that, of course, when you see something, uh, you will be frozen. Uh, so in this case, it works on a similar type of premise, and actually that would be over there, that's kind of considered the Gorgon stare. Uh, so basically, you would be equipping uh, drones with about 68 different types of cameras, and that was the first iteration of it, and uh, from what I've read right now, there's actually over about 368 uh, different cameras that could be used, and with the 368 cameras that could be used, you're basically having the capabilities and capacities to put a whole city uh, under surveillance and under observation in this case. Um, so, kind of, I, I, I know it's been used, I, I, maybe you would know a bit more if it's been used quite frequently. The name, the, the terminology in Corbett's there? Or no, just in terms of how much it's been used, I think, overall. A lot, but not just uh, photo cameras, in, yeah. but, but including other sensors, so thermal, infrared, and mm -hmm. type can, is included in that okay. sensor intake. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so kind of also uh, going off from this Gorgon stare, um, kind of tackling also this other guy idea that's uh, one book uh, from Grégoire Chamalou, uh, who wrote Drone Theory. Um, is of course looking at, as we were talking about before, concerning uh, drones and their militaristic use, uh, how drones can be deployed, of course, especially in wartime, especially when, uh, as we're seeing more and more, uh, that's a 
lot of citizens are completely disenchanted and are extremely upset concerning the state of affairs, especially in the Iraq war and also in Afghanistan, how drones are simply uh, means and mechanisms to not actually have to simply inform the population uh, that you are carrying out certain types of attacks or uh, not necessarily needing the legitimacy to carry out a certain type of, uh, a certain type of warfare. So, um, yes. But I think at the same time, uh, what else has been kind of emerging too is what they're calling a drone humanitarianism. Uh, with the drone humanitarianism, uh, this is kind of, I would say, the obverse side of it, uh, where we are seeing drones employed and used, especially in conflict-ridden zones, and as I was talking about before, uh, especially uh, when we were talking about infrastructure, and especially in zones where there's uh, areas where the infrastructure is grossly underdeveloped. Um, so, actually, this was kind of conceived of by these two artists who were talking about uh, looking at Africa, and um, in Africa right now there's actually this company that's emerging out of Silicon Valley uh, called Zipline, and what Zipline's intending to do is they are cooperating with Rwanda and Tanzania and doing over 2,000 deliveries, uh, almost daily, uh, to basically um, individuals and communities that uh, are simply needing this kind of uh, medical equipment um, which also kind of comes at the expense of trying to build up infrastructure for these types of communities, um, which, hold on, which, da, 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 which I think uh, ties into Mark Duffield, uh, who's a theorist who's been kind of discussing about this emerging trend, which I think ties into with, with drones, especially what they're talking about concerning dro uh, drone humanitarianism or digital humanitarianism. Uh, so simply you're kind of leaving communities uh, or leaving kind of, uh, you're kind of perpetuating the cycle of uh, underdevelopment at the expense of having more smart technologies and uh, having kind of small cash, these kind of voucher transfer programs that have also been emerging for kind of disaster affected communities. Um, so you don't actually have to perhaps really engage and really look at transforming conditions, especially for um, communities that, uh, yeah, of course, are also uh, byproducts of colonialism that I think kind of drones, kind of this digital humanitarianism that's been emerging uh, in, in a certain sense legitimizes or normalizes. Um, so, and yes, as I was talking about briefly before with kind of the alternative uses, uh, I will kind of start wrapping up here. Um, I think one of the also the conspicuous examples that is going on concerning uh, drones in the urban space is especially right now, uh, Japan is leading the way uh, with using drones and they're leading the way due to the fact uh, what's been an emerging trend is that as we know Japan has a declining labor force um, and due to its declining labor force uh, there's estimates I think about 1.25 uh, million, uh, there's going to be 1.25 million less uh, workers uh, to be working on construction sites. And so what's been happening is they've uh, basically been catalyzing a whole revolution in using uh, drones and also being using these kind of automated bulldozers and automated um, uh, excavators to be working in this kind of feedback loop, automated feedback loop, um, at the expense, I think, interestingly enough, to not also have to accept any kind of immigrants uh, since that's been considered one of the criticisms that's been charged at uh, Japan's policy is that since they're having a really restrictive immigration policy and since they're having a declining population, this is kind of the uh, more or less outgrowth of it that you're kind of legitimizing and uh, inducing more automation. So I think I'll stop it there in terms of uh, some of the tendencies that are emerging with drones. And so if you guys wanted to pick up on um, any kind of topics, I think it's a good recap of, of where drones are going. Um, I think, I'm glad you brought in drone humanitarianism as well, because it's a lot of times an aspect that's overlooked uh, in it, and a lot of people have the preconception of what a drone is based off of war. So uh, I think you also brought that out of it. Uh, a lot of the drone and architecture coming out of it is based off this idea of a raptor drone, or uh, depending on if you have the idea of a rotary versus a fixed wing drone. 
Um, so how it's shaping industries, how it's shaping fields, um, really changes the dynamic of the drone, uh, how you foresee it. Also not discussed uh, so much is the, the ground-based drone or the wheel-based drone, um, anything like that, or the degree of autonomy of it. Uh, are these drones controlled or are they not controlled? So we've, we've had human controlled drones or, or uh, robots that perform tasks um, that are not autonomous. They don't operate on an algorithm. They don't, uh, they're just a human operator. We saw last night or two days ago with the autonomous vehicle from Uber in Texas um, put us a step back as far as the development of drones um, due to that, based on the, the uh, sense that we have drones with autonomy coming in. Um, but there is a, a huge uh, advance in technology for drones uh, due to the, the increase of military leading technology in, in just uh, evaporating the fog of war. Um, so sight is, is another key aspect that you bring up, uh, and that's good to, to say that, that. The big push with some of these aerial drones in the top conical view uh, of the land comes from a visual perspective. So. What about other drones that sense radioactivity or what about drones that smell or, or hear or pick up sound and navigate based off of that um, GPS based tracking and whatnot. So we, we have a whole slew of drone uh, families coming out of this Raptor uh, fixed wing UAV, uh, unmanned aerial vehicle. Uh, so there's a lot of directions we can go with it, uh, but war is really shaping it. It really is. I, I agree with that point that you put. <clears throat> Considering that you mentioned war, uh, I think uh, it was sort of brushed upon with, with the boomerang effect, which uh, I guess was framed by, by, by Foucault previously. Another, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, concept here which might be useful for us is the concept of biopolitics, of uh, uh, letting live and, uh, and letting die, uh, or making live and letting die. Um, I think this sort of ties in very interestingly to, way, uh, to the way drones are used and uh, what Shamayu in his uh, 2013 book Drone Politics talks about is necroethics and exactly, uh, I mean, how do you, uh, you know, give life and how do you let die, so to speak. So uh, the ethics of that and um, are, are definitely, definitely uh, an issue which we've been encountering through the media uh, ad infinitum, especially uh, through Obama's, um, uh, Obama's governance. Um, I think an interesting point in this is that it has been called, the drone has been called a humanitarian weapon, which is a bit of an oxymoron to say the least. Um, and the figures actually, they speak uh, quite against it. Uh, of course, it's a big uh, question of, it's a contentious question, uh, whether these remote methodologies of war um, are in fact truly, uh, let's say, less, uh, less detrimental to the civilian populace as opposed to field uh, field activities, uh, but I think it ties in sort of interestingly to this perhaps uh, the way the media is addressing the drones um, and the way humanitarianism sort of keeps appearing in the discussion. Um, the, the example Dustin gave is of course fairly explicit, but again, uh, going back to uh, Mark Duffield and, and, uh, and, and his theories, um, even there there's a bit of a discrepancy. I mean, how much can you distance yourself from let's say a third world uh, population or community which needs help? Uh, how much will remote methodologies, in a way, uh, you know, do good, and how much will uh, field work actually uh, rather rather um, increase, let's say, uh, or, or, or mitigate any problems that might appear? So I think the humanitarian aspect is sort of uh, quite interesting in this, and uh, and keeps reappearing, of course. Ben, so there's something between the Uber example you gave and the let die and the humanitarianism aspect that points for me to an elephant in the room because at a certain stage humanitarianism <coughs> is like curation, it's like conservation, uh, it's like establishing a national park or a zoo and the question of let's say letting die or having a human pedestrian obstruct the progress of developing, progress of developing uh, driverless vehicles points towards what is clearly a horizon that a lot of people don't want to discuss, which is letting go of the species, as it were. Because as we move in this kind of technological direction, the obvious implication is evolution of any kind, particularly technical evolution, does without us at a certain stage. So we're no longer talking about simply the use to which we put what we call at a given historical moment the drone, but the use to which we are put as the evolutionary catalysts 
of this technology, which has a future beyond us, potentially, if we want to talk about being a spacefaring species, we're not going to be doing it literally ourselves because we can't have this, there's no way to evolve in space for us, as it were, if you want to be really strict about it. But there is a possible space for drones, as it were, and uh, so I don't know what that seems to be. Or convertibles. <laughs> 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 it, it, it's not controlled directly by a person, but there is a, a, a level of surveillance coming from that, so does it still qualify as, a, as an object for that? It, it still has a sense that we can pick up a convertible as a, as a, as a lead into the next. Of course, I mean, with the tangent which, which Louis opened up, uh, I think the question of ethic one, ethics once again sort of comes into the forefront um, uh, because, uh, in a way, who arbiters, uh, you know, which you know, populations, who curates, so to speak, which populations live, which populations die. And uh, it's another sort of topic which Dustin broached, um, is that warfare nowadays um, is uh, oftentimes, as it perhaps always has been, uh, waged on an infrastructural level where, uh, in a way, uh, let's say water resources, uh, medical resources are uh, being uh, targeted explicitly. I mean, uh, forensic architecture had some great work uh, in 2016 with the bombing of, um, uh, of a hospital in Idlib and Aleppo. And these are, again, the ethical issues which uh, perhaps drones and uh, the, the, the advent of the machine in, uh, uh, or the unmanned machine in, um, uh, in warfare uh, sort of opens up. This, this is, this is the, the question. Another level it can be taken to, of course, there's already um, a speculation about uh, just how much of human we actually need in the loop between the sensing and the shooting, uh, sensing, targeting, shooting loop, um, which the uh, drones sort of close. Do we even need humans? Um, you know, could machines uh, make the call themselves to pull the trigger? And th this is uh, so far still in speculation, uh, but, uh, but it's definitely something to, to uh, again, address within the context of, of necroethics. Yeah, that raises a very interesting question, because if you look at the kind of footage that comes out into the public, and so the documentaries have been focusing on uh, civil, particularly civilian casualties, and not just the ethics of targeting individuals, having a kill list, and so on and so forth. Um, but how you have these, usually like three uh, individuals concerned with navigating, piloting, and targeting with drones, and they're human beings, and of course the question of AI is always that oh, it's a possibility, it's something you should protect against, and so on and so forth. And just to be a little bit provocative, I wonder to what extent the fact that we actually get to see some of this footage is in a way an alibi. Because as long as there's human error, uh, we don't have to really consider the possibility that AI might be actually being used in the field. As long as we have an alibi to say, oh, it's human error, the technology isn't bad. So does that make it better or worse? The pilot to a degree is also running an algorithm, checking boxes and saying, oh, there's three beards on these three bearded individuals here. So there's also an algorithm being followed to that degree. Of it. And you have a human controller on top of a human pilot who's also acting as an extension of that. I think what this opens up, uh, sort of a very interesting uh, maybe frame of discourse, is the fact that even the kill lists are being devised through uh, monitoring activities, much like you know we can go online and see uh, you know where we went a week, week ago, kind of, um, and we can see the patterns. Of course, this is actually being done, and kill lists are being de uh, developed on the basis of, in a way, circumstantial. Um, evidence, perhaps, if we can say that. Um, simply you engaging in certain activities with certain individuals can actually put you on a kill list. And uh, again, it's a remote methodology. Nobody knows if you're selling them flour or if you're, you know, Al-Qaeda. Uh, so, but, but, but you can be on a kill list anyway. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's an algorithm, you know. Multiple like. events that, that correspond to a single... But kills have been made purely on signal intelligence, right? Fine like flower. like SIGINT. And, or who you've spoken to. Right. But if right. there's a coagulation or a node specific to that, then you've spoken with three people right. within the last minute. Uh, they're all related to the same situation. So there you go for it. Was. And uh, apparently, maybe going back to the ethics, I mean, um, uh, it's sort of guilt by association. A lot of people uh, who... Uh, whose inf uh, engagement with, let's say, you know, uh, terrorist cliques is questionable, are simply uh, written off as collateral, sim but uh, in a way taken as guilty simply due to their associating with persons who have been proven 
to uh, uh, to actually engage in these activities. So that's a you know that's a gray zone. I mean, I don't know. I, I think what we're coming to is just to draw it towards the question of architecture, right? Because we're talking about information architectures, we're talking about algorithms and the way in which humans become agents for algorithmic logics that are sort of directing us to make human decisions as the supervisors of machines and so on and so forth. And when we look at these logics, these architectures, um, we, can, we can perhaps approach again this question of prosthesis differently. If we think of drones as tools, as things that we use, we're still observing this kind of binary, that technology is something separate from us, that there isn't this feedback and so on and so forth, or that we are, as it were, the prosthesis of the technology. And this, I think, is, is coloured a lot of the discussions about architecture, for example. If we, if we say, okay, drones are going to be used to deliver pizzas or to, you know, to, 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 to deliver various other things and so on and so forth, how do we modify existing urban structures to accommodate this? How do we introduce air traffic control measures and blah, 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 blah. How do we take what already exists, a human environment, and incorporate this new use within that? rather than thinking, okay, how do we rethink the whole idea of architecture? How does this informational system imply architectures that aren't necessarily human centered <coughs> and that we're deluded anyway if we believe that urban spaces were ever, as it were, human centered. Uh, urban spaces we understand will evolve with the Industrial Revolution and are industrially evolved uh, organisms, in a sense. They are intelligent architectures. And drones, in a sense, they're not just some little artifact that gets plugged into that, uh, but they are extensions, as it were, of a, of a logic. They are, in a sense, this kinetic uh, or operational extension of either information systems or a so-called internet of things that we tend to think of as either uh, inert and not moving, more or less, like your microwave oven or something like that, you know, or uh, a Wi-Fi network. And uh, the drones happily move around and in a way, while they seem innocuous, they, they represent a, a, a radical step away from that thinking of robotics, a certain kind of anthropomorphic robotics that has to look like us and act like us. And here you have a drone that can move in its own, you know, we have aerial drones that through the space. space. You know, mm -hmm. redefining that. Well, I think that sorry. brings in to that. Uh, I think the way we conceptualize drones in the, in the first thought uh, determines how you make laws for it, and, and the laws human-made, human-rationalized, uh, uh, determines the architectural space in the long run. So drones in some countries were seen as model airplanes uh, with a, a better remote or higher or gyros on, gyroscopes on the bottom of that rather than a fixed wing. Uh, so a lot of countries seeing them as model planes still see them as a toy, which is not an extension of the human, but as entertainment for uh, a hobbyist where other countries see them as vehicles. So laws between Europe versus the US, contrasting on that degree, in the US they're registered as vehicles and you have to have a, you have to have a permit uh, to re-register with FAA. Some countries in Europe as well, but the law in Europe uh, across European countries states that you cannot use that drone as an extension of, your, of yourself. You cannot use the view uh, from the, or the camera on a drone to uh, gauge your, your situational awareness of it. You have to have visual sight of the drone at all times as a, as a hobbyist. Now, to go into commercialized drones, or to go into um, military drones is another story. But how these have been conceptualized and coming from the private laws or personal laws of use uh, really determines that. So it brings me to the next point that you kind of came up with. Space is, is where do you design something or where do you uh, design an architecture that's accommodating to drones? And is it applicable to humans in the same way? And, with war, a lot of times you get to start from scratch, unfortunately. I mean, we're looking at empty spaces uh, which have followed after drone bombings. Uh, you clear the space flat out. When it's rebuilt, uh, if a government is rebuilding it, it, in some cases it's better built for better surveillance. So you have different streets in different ways. Uh, and in the context, in commercial or in industry, the ability to move from a human space, which is built for humans, and to put it into a robotic space, to restructure it completely, it is actually quite infeasible. So you have to start from scratch. You have to build a new facility entirely for drones to function on. It has to be perfectly level, 
at the moment. Humans are able to adapt to, to uh, slight differences in floors and they can balance themselves. Some drones can't. So the architecture um, built from the technology depends on the extent of the technology meeting a human's needs or human's uh, form. So I, I think the, the main point of that is that it seems we're going to have to start from scratch and, and space is one of the areas where there is no current architecture except for uh, Earth's orbit. But, uh, well, I mean, uh, you sort of touched on the, the question of legality and uh, um, uh, it seems that maybe bringing in uh, the concept of um, uh, politics of verticality, Al Weitzman's um, mm -hmm. uh, conception, uh, used perhaps um, uh, specifically to the, or within the context of Palestine and Israel, but here very much useful. And in fact, uh, Mitchell Sipas, um, um, a designer and, and a thinker, has developed uh, sort of offhand this idea of like, um, uh, in a way, volumetric zoning that within cities you have, of course, zoning, which is horizontal at the moment, that what we will have to actually develop for drones is volumetric, that there will be a z-axis, uh, a vertical axis, which would uh, perhaps be either a no-go zone for drones or a green zone for drones or an occasional uh, zone of access. Let's say that um, uh, if, there's a, if there's a match being played um, uh, somewhere on a field, for that, the duration of that match, drones will be prohibited because there's actually market interests on uh, uh, televising that match, et cetera, et cetera. So we can get into quite complex things with, in a way, standing cities without you know, developing any new, um, uh, new facilities. Uh, and that this volumetric aspect to it, I think, is, a, is kind of interesting that uh, perhaps uh, we will see this and perhaps we need to start thinking in a way vertically. What's interesting, I think, in the war context is that there's already a concept uh, which is called the kill box, that uh, from a certain point uh, in the engagement and the encroachment on the target, uh, there is a kill box set up, that anything in that box, which is a box, it's not a square, um, is, uh, uh, is open for targeting or for the drone. So anything in, inside that box can be killed. So it's type of like a, a temporary autonomous, you know, volumetric, uh, volumetric zoning, I think. Of course, completely, you know, uh, predicated on war and, and destruction, of course, but... And the kill box is also very geometric, and very rectangular. Mm -hmm. Organic material isn't to the degree a uh, drone can recognize it. Well, that might be a fallacy. Yeah, I, I should uh, hold my tongue on that one. Maybe we can open up the discussion, uh, of course, at this point, uh, if anybody wants to come in with uh, a comment, a question. Kind of like, um, <clears throat> basically, um, the other elephant in the room, which I think is, is the thing that we talked about was artificial intelligence. And in the end, this is a physical factor of that, and that's what we're going to get to. Uh, and we're looking at leaders on artificial intelligence. We're basically looking at China, states that have authoritarian tendencies because they're able to gather data. Because the essential tenet of artificial intelligence is you're as good as the data set you have. Uh, and China is way ahead of anyone else. We're probably going to see Russia uh, catch up with them at some stage. So perhaps, and then we talked about, someone said something about post-colonialism, but you see drones in some ways as the great leveler, or artificial intelligence as the great leveler, uh, where now this control of data is not coming from the West anymore, it's actually coming from another part of the world. Even India, where I come from, where every single human being now has a fingerprint in the system of the unique identified, right? Uh, it, 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 it's a very uh, sort of alternative way to look at it, and in some ways insulting, but does their control of data then make that uh, the great leveler in terms of how the West views things? Great leveler in terms of geopolitics. <laughs> well, I mean, if you think it's been talking about Yeah, but you know, when you talk about post colonialism and so on, there's also a popularist aspect to it, you know, that there's going to be some sort of emancipatory effect. And as we keep seeing, I mean, it's interesting that Veet was talking about regulation. And when you read about drones, yes, people talk ad nauseum about the need to regulate, need for regulation, so on and so forth. Well, you know, the internet has been around for a while now, and there are a whole lot of areas where there haven't been regulation. And we think about what are the kinds of regulations that might be brought into even the playing field or, or whatever, you know, or to give, as it were, people some uh, advantage from these kinds of changes because. When you say China, you know, or, or, or India, speaking in terms of nation-state, 
is, is, is already a little bit as if it also represents a people, as if there's some strictly sort of political consequence of all of this. Um, I don't know. I'm very I'm, I'm very skeptical, of course. It has leveled the playing field a little bit more in war, uh, and you have a state, non-state, uh, Islamic state um, that has been at the forefront of experimenting with DIY drones, so and drone attacks, but not just drone attacks, but as well as surveillance. Um, so they've been building their own drone systems to be able to uh, drop grenades on soldiers and whatnot. And we heard about that. And one of the requested items for uh, donating to ISIS in the States, for example, is a, buying a drone in the States from Amazon.com and then sending that drone overseas uh, to supply them with drones. And there was that great attack that they were well known for uh, with 13 drones uh, flying in swarm formation uh, going against, the, I think it was the Russian forces that they, they, they dropped bombs on, and going to the level of even suicide drones, which the Israelis are very good at making. Um, so that uh, there is leveling of playing field in war, and if war can shape the culture behind that uh, and shape and change that paradigm in post-colonialism, then there is a degree uh, of leveling. As far as society and work architecture goes, um, that yeah, I, I'm a little skeptical about it as well. I'm curious about the humanitarian application, though, because you know so much when we talk about infrastructure which is a part of the mantra of the IMF and the World Bank and so on. In infrastructure tends to be a very invasive way of increasing debt in the so-called third and developing worlds and whatnot. And to what extent infrastructure is ever really uh, useful in, as it were, solving some uh, problem of one order or another is questionable too. I'm, I'm curious as to whether or not, whether or not drones solve any problems is this idea of kind of a guerrilla architecture. To get back to the architecture thing too, is that the, the kinetic nature of drones as we understand them are basically the unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, and the capacity just to move in without involving heavy fixed infrastructure and, 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 and even some necessarily local power structures and whatnot, just to move in and accomplish something or whatever needs to move and adjust and move away. Uh, I think if, if you want to talk about sort of leveling playing fields and to bring it down to some sort of Community, you know, you're talking about guerrilla warfare. Even this, this, is, this is interesting with regards to a relationship to power. Because on the one hand, we're talking about drones that are either being commercially driven or driven by military interests, uh, and, and how do we, as it were, democratize uh, this kind of technology as something that can also be hacked against some monolithic mm -hmm. control apparatus? Yes, power plant. Power lines being a main obstacle for drones in urban space. Uh, what does the, I mean, on the argument of post-colonialism, though, you brought up uh, Senegal or Ken, uh, Kenya, uh, uh, Tanzania, 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 the other side there. But they're also actually conceiving of the idea that bricks would also be delivered to kind of bricks, vacuum areas. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> what does Africa have a lot of that Chinese are very interested in at the moment? There's, there's a lot of space. They have a lot of open space. <laughs> where there's unregulated space for drones to fly, I think, possibly. And they used to go earlier with uh, hubs for transporting yeah. drones yeah. between the yeah. fields. And we're seeing a lot of that with uh, drone deliveries, just making hubs where you have a chute to drop packages in so a drone never has to land at a certain point and just return back to the home. But in Africa, where China's taking a lot of interest in building infrastructure, there's a lot of space at the moment. This, this, this is a really good point. You want to talk about post-colonialism, I think this is one of the areas. It's not so much, it's not so sort of historical colonialism, but it's, it's sort of economic colonialism and whatnot. Whether it's in areas with low regulation, or even urban spaces where you have underprivileged communities, all those kinds of non-places non, non within urban areas, under flyovers and so on, where people are talking about these drone hubs or hives, where are they going to be positioned? Let's talk about reclamation of, of these kinds of areas within cities. And they're clearly not going to be in highly desirable residential areas. Um, so that way, that way sort of repurposing uh, places of economic underprivileged, as it were, um, as, as places of center sense of drone traffic. Uh, this, this, this is an interesting uh, development. Uh, a lot of the source of the power for any kind of autonomous drone is the 
the Wi-Fi capability or the, the, the signal. So that's the problem with wide open space is you don't have so much signal. It's sort of within connection. Yeah, or Mark Zuckerberg, but I don't think his drone is going to fly very far into the green internet TV. I'm wondering, uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit on the sort of leveling which you talked about? I mean, because you were thinking in terms of, uh, I guess, uh, geopolitics. We were talking about war, so I was continuing in that trend of uh, broad leveling in terms of, you know, the West has the technology and therefore you're seeing a sort of colonialist use of this technology in Afghanistan and everywhere else. But now, because China, India, Russia, whoever else uh, gets access to the artificial intelligence and the data sets, and therefore, you know, this is something else that means. Uh, you, the European Union has, has lags far behind any other country, any other region in the world in artificial intelligence, simply because the privacy rights uh, trump at everything else. So therefore, uh, you don't have data sets that the European Union can, people here can use off to, to build artificial intelligence. But you have these massive data sets in these other countries where there's no regulation. Uh, and therefore, they will at some stage be able to, the theory goes, make more effective uh, drones or weapons based on artificial intelligence. And therefore, uh, at some stage, perhaps level that, that sort of gap uh, in technology that the West seems to have, at least when we talk about from purely geopolitical or economic terms. E economic, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this is, this is clearly an area where America is being seeking to extend its reach with, you know, Alfred McCoy talking about triple canopy. This is a permanent extended presence from stratosphere to exosphere where America will have uh, a drone network in the skies 24 hours a day, which is an extension of a kind of informational architecture. Uh, and we know an extension already of a surveillance system that takes everything. Um, so that's, that's, that's clearly topical, these, these maintaining balances of power and so on. I think on the regulation part of, on that as well is how, uh, back to my point of how the drone laws have been shaped, uh, it's really going to shape how authority uses it versus civilians or, or non-governmental people, um, the common people um, in the West. So uh, America has been really big at hunkering down uh, and using drones for primarily a governmental purpose and making it a little bit more difficult for regular civilians to use the drones. Uh, so you have even a separation in Western countries where that's existing. You don't have that separation so much in um, non Western one of that degree. Um, that really shapes it and it creates this um, capitalist framework around the drone because if you're okay with drones being used by the government and you can't buy yourself uh, according to different privacy laws, uh, as a customer of a service of a drone, you are consenting to it being used, so you have the capital to be able to purchase that at uh, drone service. Uh, you won't have that same kind of ability in non Western country to the degree that separation between state and, and people. Uh, Europe is really nice right now with the uh, exploration of drones because there's, there isn't that, that division yet, but there will soon be very harsh privacy laws that will inhibit a lot of this surveillance that goes through. So that division will become quite radical uh, soon. And I'm interested in uh, like the cycle of effect of, um, of the drone in terms of if you're helped by a drone in a humanitarian case like can you not be helped by a human or if you're killed by a drone I mean the thing is that can not at least a human being kill you like what I mean is this uh, is this unhumanizing level of, of the war uh, when you're on an occupied Pal Palestinian territory and there's a drone that is uh, surveilling you, I think the effect is also the you know that it's, you're not even you're even lower than a robot. You're even lower than an object. So I'm interested in also in this uh, psychological effect because, for example, the killers, the soldiers of the U.S. Army that are in Phoenix and they are killing people in Pakistan, they they have this the the post the stress syndrome anyway because they come back to their life, but in the evening they don't come back later. And they, they actually uh, had this, the, the stress that even if they were, were going to war zones. So I'm just curious if you have any If I may, on that. This, I, I read about this. It's not actually PTSD that they have, but it's um, uh, uh, a perpetration 
induced traumatic stress. So it's actually like, you know, induced by perpetration, like via this sort of prosthesis of killing. And of course, there always used to be like, a, uh, or at least officially, a maxim, you know, uh, an ethical maxim in war, you shouldn't kill unless you are willing to be killed. There's this sort of like, uh, you know, heroic sort of, sort of, uh, of course, narrative around that. That's a great question. I, I suppose, but um, the preference. Uh, separation, uh, not being able to be killed while killing. Fair enough. Yeah, and that's of course a, a big aspect. Regarding what you were uh, talking about, psychology of those being killed, well, uh, it's enough to maybe talk about those who uh, simply have to endure uh, the sort of uh, the, the canopy, which we mentioned, this uh, sort of uh, actually Edward Snowden called drone persistence, this like 24 hour constant. Um, a presence of the drones, the holy grail of, of, uh, of the military at the moment. And uh, just having that living in, uh, let's say, cities which are uh, exposed to, to, to this technology, uh, it does, uh, it's a terrible strain. It's a permanent uh, fear of, um, of being killed or maimed. Uh, people dream of it uh, and long, there's long-term psychological effects actually which come out of simply having the technology near you, knowing that you may be the target you know, uh, collateral damage in a way, so. You can, you, you can hear it, yeah, yeah. There's also a project from Friends in Architecture where they show um, that the drones that are, for example, killing in an urban environment uh, in Pakistan is that they make a hole inside the house and the, the bomb, when it explodes inside the house in the middle of the room, uh, it just affects human body, but doesn't affect the urban environment. So therefore, you're, you don't even know if you're the neighbor that someone got killed there and they are they mapped this uh, the the architecture of the weapon itself that is really um, targeting only the the human shell there was a question over there. No, no, I just wanted to try to step back from war and geopolitics and all that kind of stuff so uh, I was going to talk about urbanism education and journalism so the first time I saw the 3d scanner that could scan this room and like 20 minutes and put it in your rabbit. I was thinking that what if you put it on the drone, and I bet they do. But I also bet that in five years it will also scan the texture, maybe, or like not only the volume. So with this and with some other technology, it can be even like possible to stream the virtual reality with a drone from, from a remote location in, in, in some room or in your glasses. Uh, and you can use it in education and monument preservation and many other things. You can use it in urbanism just for studying it and researching. But uh, what we talk now about all the conflict areas uh, means that, I mean, we, we don't know how it looks, we still don't know how, what's exactly happening there, but if there was some free media that would hire you this drone or just have one that people can connect to, it can be a pirate network because it shouldn't be legal because it should tackle what's what's legal. Uh, well, and. And the, yeah, and you can go fly and see what, what, what's up, like what's really going on there, uh, and something, yeah, something like that. But what you said about market values and all this privacy, it can cooperate with this in the real ethic way of, of but not not market values like how they are now, and yeah, something like that. Well, I think what you're sort of opening up and which we sort of have been kind of broaching but never actually like getting into is this sort of insurrectionary or dem democratizing uh, element to the drone, which of course their prices are, they're getting cheaper by the minute in a way. Uh, they're more and more accessible. Uh, the software is, is more and more accessible and being open sourced and being offered of course as open source. So, uh, I mean, there's a tendency even in the media, you know, to talk about it only as a tool of war, as a tool of surveillance, as a, a tool for the, you know, powers that be. Um, I think it's, a, it's an open question, it seems to be at the moment, as to what are its potentialities as uh, a tool for, uh, let's say, uh, creating or navigating um, perhaps decentralized networks of relations. Uh, you're saying, you know, that you could sort of uh, tap into a drone, see the feed, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, yes, yeah, well, because what, what's streamed there on the TV is still... Like, there is more behind it, I'm pretty sure. And I'm from such a country that this streams it <laughs> constantly, and from Ukraine. And, and my dad is from Syria, so I also... <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. Thing. There are some I, I wish I knew what's actually going on there, because I have no idea the the Eastern part, if you come back to geopolitics, if you would like to, like, we, we don't know, no one controls that area, and, 
And there are opposition media there are in Russia, for example, there is something like that that still does not do it, but they would they use drones to, uh, to show politicians' mansions and castles, how they build it all around the world, uh, on the how it's all corrupt, that's what they do. But to actually show the conflict that those politicians also cause would help the opposition, like the real opposition more, I, I would say. And, and it should be developed in, like, and, I mean, protected and actually, like, free and, uh, because this extension of your site can be something really positive and, like, and... Actually, at the Dallas Security Conference, of uh, experimenting with uh, VR mm-hmm. and putting you in the place of like a, a migrant's journey. Like, uh, when the uh, mass migration came out of uh, the Middle East in uh, 2016, I believe. Yeah. Or it's still like a zoo concept, like uh, you mentioned. Yeah. yeah it's, it's but it goes back to the post colonialism <laughs> aspect of it is that now you're putting that separation of degree, in, and I can put on a VR. And say I experienced a drone taking place in Syria right now while it does the bombing. That, that's a little disgusting, but um, it puts that post colonial level in there. And me as an observer or viewer, it makes me feel either that I'm uh, attached to the situation or I'm knowing what's going on, I'm curious about it, uh, or that I'm maybe doing something for the incident or for the event or, or I'm doing something for the cause. Uh, but am I really? And it puts that level of post colonial uh, difference in there. I, I see your, your reason to know why or what's going on. No, I yeah. don't. No, and there, there are some stories in Ukraine when um, some drone feeds were hacked. I just talked to people who escaped this area, that's what they did, that's uh, all I know. And there's some uh, feeds where, where they are hacking uh, the opposition side, or mm-hmm. they, and they get these feeds and they're able to show them and show the entire attack go through. No, I was mostly talking about the TV and how Ukrainian TV looks like and what they actually stream. And yeah, I don't want to talk about that because it's disgusting. And, and you can imagine how, how it's all happening, but... And this actually drives two, two nations crazy, hating each other, even though they, they, they live together for, for, for years, for decades. Well, in this vein, there's a really interesting, of course, genre of, um, of the runescapes and rune creation, as, as Dustin mentioned. And uh, Russia today has actually been sort of at the vanguard of this. Uh, oftentimes, uh, flying, doing flyovers and, and uh, taking footage of, uh, let's say, neighborhoods in uh, Aleppo and, and, and homes, if I'm not mistaken, um, where uh, Russian military actually did strikes and then they fly a drone over it to show these ruins, which in a way the Russian military has, has made just a few hours previously. Why, right? And there's actually sort of this, this strange, um, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, aesthetic to it that these ruins are completely unpeopled there's no real connection with like it it seems to be a force of nature is this sort of what you get the sort of aesthetic impression like isn't war terrible right but exactly what Dustin was talking about there's this need of course with forensic architecture doing exactly that to contextualize these uh, in a way it's it's been called ruin porn right because you can kind of look at it say oh that's terrible you don't really see any people you don't know how it happened but um, but uh, this context this historical um, and maybe also uh, well, this yeah, you don't know who bombed them and where they... That's what they, they say, uh, Sina Zekabat wrote this article. Um, he actually explains that uh, from all of these, uh, that what was actually failed, uh, uh, sorry, forensic architecture is doing is that they are actually uh, analyzing the image and they are saying who made it from which point and they are really contextualizing everything and he writes actually in this article that um, that's where the levels of, uh, of abstraction and of violence are, are possible, therefore, because you're, you're so vertical, you see that it's an apocalypse, and therefore you are completely, the, the human aspect is not there, because you don't know the story, you just have this um, spectacle. Mm-hmm. So. I just have a note that uh, this is actually the, <laughs> the very video that we were talking about, this is, uh, mm-hmm. the Syrian drone footage of, uh, I mean, the Russian today footage of Syria after bombing, but it's uh, but it's uh, with the sign of action to ask a, a bit more tangential question, but it ties into the leveling that we talked about previously. Is that uh, as far as I know, uh, there is very little uh, effective defense against uh, like cheap uh, small drones that are still large enough to carry like grenades or chemical weapons or whatever, and uh, so there is this like inherent as- asymmetry that like 
Yeah, pretty much the only uh, way you can take them down is by jamming their GPS, which is why how most drones have been taken up, right? But uh, that, that doesn't work on this small scale, and I've, I've heard actually, in fact, reports from uh, soldiers that encounter these attacks that it's you pretty much can't do like uh, you, you can't shoot them down because they're too small to target, uh, and you can be like uh, easily overwhelmed by the by the. Uh, by the sheer number, well, it's still very cheap. So I'm thinking if there is like this uh, possibility of opening up this, you know, kind of I really don't know how to put it, but it's like mutual assured destruction kind of like, <laughs> or like drone contraband kind of thing. That, you know, <laughs> you can pretty much like pass a drone like anywhere, and you can do like much about it. So what, what's the what's the result the resulting situation from that? If you know the cheap the drones are cheap and available. I mean, theoretically, I won't speak, speak theoretically, but maybe practically, I mean, they're already sort of workshopping, developing this bazooka, which shoots a net, right? Apparently, I mean, it's not for swarms, but apparently it's fairly successful in taking down a single drone. Um, so just saying, you know, who knows how, how far the technology can go. But um, mm, mutually assured what destruction. You, what you're talking about, in a way, is, and you talk about post-colonialism, so we have a geopolitical situation where the major powers have certain technologies and this mutually assured destruction. But guerrilla tactics have been available to anybody and everybody around the planet since power existed. And having a little drone doesn't necessarily change that. You know, you have regimes including right here that involve the collaboration willfully or unconsciously of a whole population that potentially, arguably, had the capacity to enact drone attacks, if you like, by their person, by sabotage and so on and so forth. I don't think the drone necessarily brings anything new to that dynamic of guerrilla warfare. Um, in fact, the French are going back to organic and, and training falcons to do the same thing. Uh, and you can go back to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, where uh, Sean Connery flocks into the beach and, and makes all the pigeons fly up, or the seagulls fly up to take out some Nazi airplanes. And that's that's uh, the possibility for taking out some more. But I. I have to say, I totally see Tomash's point because, like, airspace has so far been associated with, like, say, you know, the Imperium, sort of, you know, the uh, standing powers, uh, geopolitical players, and it seems that, you know, suddenly airspace has opened up to anybody who has a, you know, few bucks to spare to buy a drone with a camera. So even for getting, uh, you know, just data, kind of, or not data, but like getting, you know, visual shots of. Uh, don't worry, privacy laws will protect that across Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> About, about time, about time. Any other questions? Well, maybe we can keep to it. I mean, I'm kind of interested, you know, smuggling a drone yeah. anywhere. I mean, um, how, how would that be like, um, how, how would that change the asymmetric nature of, let's say, um, you know, guerrilla warfare versus, uh, you know, the Imperium? Well, it doesn't necessarily need to uh, central warfare, or at least, uh, or you mentioned, you know, drug drops, or like, you know, anything that you want to Fair transport uh, in a secret fashion hmm. could be now then using a drone, so... A thumb drive attached to a miniature drone. Uh, a USB drive attached to the drone. Yeah, I mean, they're even greater than the drone. I mean, what interests me about this, and it comes back to I think what you were saying, people talk about drones and surveillance all the time, and we know that hobbyists and whatnot use cameras, Hollywood use cameras. In fact, it's changing the aesthetics of a lot of Hollywood films because of the way in which the camera work can be done. So between mass industrialized surveillance and what we sometimes call black transparency, which is basically Illicit, you know, whistleblowing, revealing of what we're not meant to be showing or not meant to, to see, and the, 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 the potential of the drone to be part of that economy of seeing. And perhaps one of the threats that the drone poses is like the threat of the revelation, the scandal. You, know, you had Abu Ghraib, you had, you had collateral murder, you had this kind of stuff. We can see, we can see the, the family in the van convoy being whacked, you know. But we can also see, if it's a guerrilla attack, and I don't know that such things have happened, that the, the fact that there's a camera, it poses a certain threat because it makes visible a vulnerability. That's, a, that's, that's one of those. That. Yeah, that's so one of those real threats. It 
brings it to your perspective of meteorology and uh, and the voyeurism of the war. I think it draws it back to the elimination of the fog of war to a degree. And it's always about trying to see beyond your your enemy's front lines. Well, in guerrilla warfare, there, there is no front line. So what is the surveillance there for? And what is the fog of war in that case? It might be a house where it only eliminates the, the organic material inside of a, a building. I have a question about the urban environment. Uh, do you think um, the air will be privatized by Amazon Oh, uh, will they? No, no. <laughs> Depending on how everything blows over between whether you want to go to market state or nation state or anything like that, but no, right now all corporations are subservient to the nation state. They all they all have to register with the aviation authority. So there, there's a clear subjection there. Not, right? Yeah, you can sell something like that. Airwaves. I mean, you can sell airwaves for mobile phone airwaves, right? You can sell that for three billion dollars, and have each country in the EU repeat that. <laughs> this is there. I mean, it's, it's beyond me. I don't, I don't think we've had that as a precedence yet. But the, the cables that are under the sea for wireless, I, I'm not. Re I don't know how this works. But is it uh, is it on national uh, bedrock sea no, there's things? A or it's a lot of the sea, so there's a certain degree from a shore that it belongs to a nation, and then beyond that is international sea. Uh, and, and the cables, yeah, it's a. But there are treaty agreements. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If there's war between these two countries, we'll continue internet connection between. And we're not going to drop anchors and. Drop anchors and yeah, there's uh, some sharks down there doing that for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think it'll be uh, just like uh, international sea law, uh, and that's a 3D space as well, uh, governing from the surface to below, to a certain degree from the shore. Um, so airspace is like that. There's already no-fly zones over stadiums uh, and airports and military zones that, that you can't fly, but you can't go there on the ground, ground either way. So. There's still that division. I don't see a difference or a change. Well, I, I guess what's, what needs to be filled up, though, is that, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, um, in the US, uh, 30 feet above any property is owned by the owner of the property. Uh, and then from 300 feet up, it's the FAA who, uh, it's the FAA's jurisdiction. So you have 30 feet, and between 30 feet and 300 feet, there's this weird uh, sort of gap which is not addressed legally as of, as of yet. So it seems that uh, I'm speaking most to drones cover 200 meters up in European law that you can't fly it above this state. Which is about yeah. okay. Come on. So if you want to fly a drone above 200 meters, <laughs> that's where you don't get any control, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly the relationship between legislation and what happens in innovation. Yeah, I was saying. Because the legislation to control. I mean, you have broadcast laws, but you know, controlling Wi-Fi. You know, and then and the question of drones harvesting information, which is one of the issues, you know, you just land, and mm -hmm. just drift by, and there it is. It's, it's public so, information. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's curious. That video that you shared with us earlier, uh, the drone bird or the drone? Uh, that was, uh, that was Flux, uh, Super Flux Lab. Um, it was drone aviary video. Uh, it's, it's nice to see, it's, a, it's an aesthetic experience, yeah. Uh, can we take humanitarian drone projects at face value when they're like so easily repurposed and could be be serving dual purposes of like surveillance in like developing countries in the first place, or they could serve to normalize like the idea that like hey, there's some weird thing flying in the sky. It's not necessarily about to kill me. Well, I mean, um, it's been there's a criticism which has been leveled at humanitarian aid in third world countries, specifically Sudan. Uh, where, uh, in fact, they are gathering data in a way. So, yes, the drone simply seems just to be an extension of that, that um, there's, there's vested interests uh, sort of already in place, which the drone doesn't quite change. It's a new you know, tool uh, to play with, perhaps, you know, save manpower, whatever, save energy, but the, it, it won't change the infrastructure. It's, I think the humanitarian group NGOs are, are either um, by custom or their, their doctrine uh, public or, or their information is already leaked uh, substantially enough that there's not, a, there's not a level of security with NGOs that protects any data to a degree. So using drones might create another vector for that. Um, so you can 
capture the artist uh, data, for example? Yeah, and sure, one of the military drones in the first place broadcasting like video feed unencrypted. Yes. And then there were like instances of like uh, insurgents being able to like monitor like the uh, yeah what what the belligerent was seeing. And that and, and that's it in that sense like it actually might give a significant sense of power because then they, you can see what the other person does but they don't necessarily know where you're walking. Mm -hmm. Well, they're encrypted now apparently, so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I would maybe like to ask Dustin in this vein, it, it very ties, very much ties into the question, is uh, of course Mark Duffield with the bunker and remote uh, remote methodologies of, of sensing in a way. Um, hmm. Considering <laughs> just elaborating on that point. Yeah, yeah, no, with the humanitarian sort of... Sort of Most part of journalism in the, in the yeah. discussion, so I think it's a similar point with... Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I would just riff on, you know, uh, obviously that kind of same points, and I think it's interesting enough, more or less what Mark Duffield's talking about, too. Uh, also, tying in this idea of a bunker humanitarianism, uh, because he explores this idea, which is becoming increasingly prevalent in uh, the global south, especially in African countries, where you're seeing even uh, kind of gated humanitarian centers, so a lot of, um, you know, like UNESCO, um, and also a lot of these NGOs, uh, what they're doing is, of course, they're having the gates, and then inside the gates, they're also having access to, uh, you know, basically a whole panel of digital satellite imagery. And via this digital satellite imagery, uh, kind of Duffield's making that whole point that uh, essentially what we lose is a ground friction, uh, meaning that uh, we have, it's more or less undermining our ability to go out and interact uh, specifically with communities of need uh, or uh, basically kind of a whole environment that ideally we're still in this kind of savior complex from the western angle that we're there to serve, we're there to help and assist. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's really pointing out how it also, Duffield also points out this idea of, of kind of risk factorization uh, that kind of drones and also satellite imagery uh, enable, uh, suggesting that simply being able to monitor large swaths of lands that uh, more or less could be considered turbulent or there might be uh, some type of uh, potential conflicts uh, emerging, uh, that could be a way of actually not going out and engaging with the communities and just staying embedded within the whole kind of bunker uh, and kind of complex, security complex. Um, so yeah, I mean, cybernetic kind of humanitarianism, cybernetic technology, I mean, it's a very kind of simplistic dimension to it, but uh, this kind of dimension, this kind of distancing element has really profound effects, and I think that's obviously uh, what you were pointing out too before, uh, you know, kind of the drone being the naturalization of forgetting and naturalization of just uh, further neglecting, you know, communities and populations. So, I mean, I think that's a really powerful elements when it comes to uh, such a thing as a drone and kind of pointing out to that integrative object or dimension as altogether. I mean, humans simply just disappear, we vanish, because we can now simply uh, more or less become really domesticated and we can really become uh, kind of anchored in specific places, specific cubicles, very specific um, uh, overall settings that doesn't require us to go uh, to go out and kind of engage, even though I think kind of engage with the natural environment, even though natural is a bit <laughs> of, an, of a complex term, I would use that. But yeah, I suppose that would be kind of my two cents in this case. This, this comes back to one of the things I wanted to talk about with architecture, you know, because again, so much that you read is application, mm -hmm. use, application. And there's a question for me of what I would call logic capture, or you're talking about cybernetics. Mm -hmm. And once you once you get beyond the novelty of having these toys and what we're going to use them for, and then discover that they're embedded, and that you are now entangled mm -hmm. in their logic, so as, as as it were, as, as part of that whole algorithmic process, it's affected the entire infrastructure. Of, of your world mm -hmm. and the way that you think. It's interesting that, of course, America pioneering this whole cybernetic approach to intelligence and surveillance and so on and so forth, and, uh, and it's been with us for uh, you know, over 50 years or more. 
the point that we still imagine and that movements like Occupy bring to the fore, that we still imagine the spaces that we inhabit as being public spaces, we imagine we can inhabit, inhabit cyberspace in a public way and not understand that the very logic of social media is already cyberneticized. You know, it's not a perversion of social media that there are algorithms and harvesting data and metadata. And that's, that's part of what social media is. So when we talk about drones and drone futures and drone architectures, I think we need to, to consider precisely these implications of cyberneticization. I mean, there's also various discussions that have been emerging concerning, uh, yeah, that's in a very simplistic way that they would conceive of uh, how drones would kind of reshape the urban environment uh, due to the fact that probably buildings <coughs> are going to have to be a bit more jagged or kind of uh, a bit more morphed to kind of be to serve even drones landing and giving delivery and, and packages. So uh, that's kind of been one discussion point or now also that uh, kind of the uh, going back to this kind of vertical perspective or this uh, vertical hegemony, if you will. Um, how even kind of buildings are going to have to be, building sites are going to have to be preoccupied with even the top, uh, the very top of the very kind of roofs of their drone because that's going to be also uh, an indicator for real estate value or that could also be an indicator of, uh, of how long the kind of building site could be preserved. So um, that's, that's just another way of kind of, in, you know, keeping it as uh, vertical and as uh, I guess as high as possible like this. Yeah. It's like the Uber thing. Yeah. You know, because if, if pedestrians are a problem, and, and then the solution is to get rid of the pedestrians. They are actually having drone, they're, they're conceiving of actually drone taxis right now. That's actually doing some uh, investment into that field, but I don't, it doesn't seem like there's been any significant uh, um, leeway. But yeah, there's been some considerations on how that would also change the architecture. Every pedestrian could have a follow drone hovering above them that indicates to a driver that uh, you shouldn't run right over me. <laughs> I want to bring it back to the humanitarian part that I always I give that example for Duffield with uh, one of the tsunamis in Indonesia uh, and how logistics really shapes this, uh, the, well, the supply chain really changing uh, the architecture or the, the landscape in there and how. Certain humanitarian organizations weren't able to reach out to communities in Indonesia. It makes you wonder: Are they bunkered in? Mm -hmm. Are they able to service this amount of people? And going back to biopolitics, or is, it, or is it just like a simple binary between yeah. the global north being bunkered in? I mean, that goes yeah. back to just a very uh, basic idea about mediation and kind of. I mean, simply the fact is, still about two or three billion people do not have regular access to internet. But, Case too. In Indonesia, Coca Cola was the only logistic or the only company able to get the, the medicine out to people in remote villages, and the NGOs weren't able to do that. that that's a very strange logistic, just in the name of the game. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's yeah. how I think it's really going to show, shape a lot of that architecture. Logistical but perception. What about drones being able to help enable NGOs to be able to do more so they can have a human face at the same time of having a drone and actually and service? I say that liberally service a larger part of the population. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's actually what the uh, apparently United Nations is also looking into right now, mm -hmm. um, in kind of correlation to collecting all the vast data, um, uh, you know, the smart messaging that's occurring where, you know, we're even looking at, you know, arguments about Kenya. In Kenya and also in a lot of these, uh, even Tanzania, people there are obviously having greater access to cell phones as opposed to access to water, and clean water, and also to uh, hospitals and also to educational centers. And as as Huawei. Yeah, so I mean, again, it's just kind of this uh, remote humanitarian uh, access. You mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> You said collecting data, though, you see it more cyberneticized now with the UN approach? Of taking biometrics of people so they yeah, can register with a with a recognition of a drone, for example. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the UN also, uh, yeah, of course, we're having those kind of food voucher programs. Also, you know, building up solar panels. There's the biggest, I think, the biggest solar panel. Or one of the biggest solar panels is actually in uh, in Jordan. And so again, it's they're just all they have to do is they just the, this community or actually refugee camp has to just maintain the solar panels. So it's just kind of, you know, leaving them out in the wilderness to take care of everything. and Jack Sun God in the middle of the Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Maybe, really shaping that another, another very maybe we can take another question. There was one. Uh, I'm so sorry. Okay. I guess I have a question for what we're asking all four of you. Well, if we had to summarize, and our drones are good or bad, because we've talked about the good, we've talked about the bad. I'm not asking for black or white, but I'm trying to just perhaps assume that because well, because our our experience of the drone in, in sort of popular culture narrative is the UAV. Uh, and, and, and all its broader implications. Perhaps bro, don't, drone, drones don't get that benign treatment that your average you know, Honda robot does. Uh, but essentially, it's the same thing, just a different face of it. Um, so, and, and there's a lot of stuff that's very uh, sort of inspiring about the democratization uh, that drones can do. Uh, but if, if I was to ask you somewhere early, what would you say? Are they good or are they bad? Or, or are we still sort of in the I think drones are exactly the something. And that is, firstly, they're highly mobile. They're highly kinetic robots. They can get around. They're not in, in, inhibited or, or, or obstructed in the way that a lot of conventional, as when we think of conventional robots that are, that are mobile. Um, they navigate through information systems uh, that we use, wireless networks, GPS, and so on and so forth. So they're very much embedded in this informational realm. They're kinetic. Uh, they can be. 3D printed, they, they seem to me to represent this evolutionary phase bringing together all these elements of the cybernetic sphere and pointing for me towards the real meaning of the Anthropocene, which is not so much that we have transformed the world, but that, that we are, as it were, these catalysts of a technical evolution, which is starting to consolidate all these areas from the industrial informations and revolutions. Uh, towards something that we might call uh, autonomous or artificial intelligence. That's what I see drones as representing. On the good and bad though, do you, is this pro-human or against you? <laughs> you brought it up at the beginning, you said... Is, that good or, is, is, human, is human good or bad? I mean, in, in, in all this discussion, we've been very self-interested, right? <laughs> it's, it's the paranoia, are drones looking at us? Are they going to shoot us? I mean... <laughs> You mentioned the possibility of eliminating the human from the, the drone mm-hmm. question, and that, that, that is about Well, what okay, that. the good side of it is, insofar as we want to live on after our own demise, the, 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 <laughs> drone, the drone is a hypothesized image of that living on. <laughs> it's true. I guess it depends, good or bad, for whom, right? I mean, for the machines or for the people, of course. But the machines think of that level, it's good or bad, necessarily. No, but we do. Yeah, we are, of course, we're machines, but it's just different levels of arrangement and complexity about it. And of course, between silicon chip and a uh, carbon chip as well. Well, there's almost a class structure which we're opening up here. Mm-hmm. Like, well, there's a big issue about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess, like, on the question of, like, uh, how drones affect logistics and how that affects architecture. Like, the way I see it, there's like two currents with drones, and that, like, or like specifically logistics and architecture, in that uh, something like an autonomous car incentivizes perhaps like urban sprawl or it low, significantly lowers the cost of like a, sending goods over like very wide, very far apart places. However, like the uh, small little uh, four rotor drone is like specifically optimized for delivering like point to point really close, it can't actually deliver for that far. And like the Heft of the things that it's delivering is very, very limited as well. I'm like, well, marine, so because of just like physics. Um, so, like, what I'm seeing is that the the car, the, the, the autonomous car is going from, yeah, this urban sprawl, these like uh, very disconnected uh, points of maybe luxury or enclaves. And, and then, like, the tiny drone, like, this like hyper uh, urbanized, uh, hyper. Uh, what they call population density increase is like incentivized and I do you see these two currents fighting against each other who wins out and could potentially like the drones have like a class could become class coded because of this class structure among drones <laughs> I think these are just alibis we, we find a use to to provide a causality for something it's like saying a mobile phone is a communication device or the television was for information and entertainment as opposed to creating a captive audience for advertising. You know, so I think that when we look at things like drones flying about or, or other forms of autonomous vehicle, uh, 
the causality isn't in the immediate use that we can justify to ourselves based on deliveries or urban sprawl and so on and so forth. I think they lie elsewhere. I think I was going opposite with the development of laws being based off of the rotor ring versus fixed wing drones and the association that we have with fixed wing drones, uh, military aspect and rotary wing with hobbyists and entertainment and toys and civilian life, which is not true anymore after DIY drones. But uh, I, I think it was shaping the human perspective, but in the long term, and creating a different class in how we see them. It's all anthropomet centric in the end. Any more questions? Why is it called drone unarmed danger? <laughs> oh, because simply I was just interested in Gordon Mattock Clark for the in architecture. And the idea about disintegration and entropy and uh, looking at obviously these kind of Sites being damaged and destroyed, and having machinic vision being there after the scene to kind of look at what's what humans have left to and remained. So kind of looking at uh, drones as being an archival device or kind of an archival agent, uh, and, or kind of some to kind of study. I, I suppose in, in this case, like human pathology. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, human destruction. So I suppose that was kind of my angle on it. You know, Gordon Matter Clark, with those kinds of <laughs> deconstructed yeah. buildings, what's so interesting with that is almost everything that we've spoken about has been, again, use oriented. It's been functional, it's okay. been utilitarian. I love somebody like Jean Tongli who produced satirical, self destroying machines that were the opposite of utilitarian. And when we think about, now we know social media is not innocent. But when mobile phones first came out, the idea of social media was remote and fantastic. And to many, it would seem to be highly trivial use of this technology. And maybe with the Gordon Mather Clark idea, which you think about architecture and drones and so on, is not so much an elephant in the room, but the blind spot in the room, is what is going to be the kind of deconstructive element of, of drones <laughs> that we just don't see because we're so preoccupied with what their use is going to be that justifies the existence. Unknown, unknown. I think the open space we also discussed uh, with that aspect, uh, the, the tabula rasa of, of building drone oriented architecture is that need for a fresh start. Well, uh, I guess time's pressing a bit. Any last questions? If not, um, we'd like to thank very much uh, uh, Viper for having us. Uh, also, we would like to thank Tomas Mare, who's sitting with us here, who did uh, these visuals. Um, would you like to maybe say a bit about them? Well, uh, as Dustin mentioned, the uh, TV over there is uh, the uh, footage of a garden stair, the uh, surveillance technology that has been discussed. Over there be behind is, in fact, the collateral murder, as was mentioned, as was also mentioned. And I think that has been said about this uh, presentation, which uh, I actually made in processing, if it's of interest to anybody. <laughs> and uh, I've made it on based on Dustin's uh, slides, which, which I pretty much just like uh, transformed into <laughs> what you see on the screen. So thank you for all, um, allowing me to uh, express <laughs> and help you with this. Uh, thank you very much. Also, oh, thank quick, you. quick mention about Philip Power, who also uh, if you have uh, if you have questions about that, he has a game he showed to us was uh, about a crafter going through space, and it's a very complex cognitive test. And it will, be, it will be, I guess, available for, for viewing or playing? Yeah, it will be available tonight if you want to be in July. I don't know if I have to know that we go and get a book. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for studying.